So one more. One more. Um, a few days ago, my cousin started her first year teaching, and she needed a bunch of stuff for her classroom, so ordered some stuff for her classroom. Hey man, hey man, cool. That was cool, man. Meeting the needs of the people. All right, so along with those questions, just be just be uh just be mindful that maybe your your answers may or may not change depending on what we learned today. That sounds cool. All right. So, all right, let's get into the text. Um the text that we're coming from is Luke 10:25 through 37. A lot of you guys may be familiar with it, but that's what we're going to be talking about today, all right? I'm going to give you guys like maybe 2 seconds to like, you know, find Luke 10 verses 25 through 37. Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. All right. When you got it, say, I got it. All right, cool. Let's get started. All right. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. All right, let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, we come to you firstly and foremost to say thank you. Thank you, God, for the people that are here. Thank you, dear Father, for uh, this truth serum Bible study, dear Father. Um, I pray, God, that um, as we continue to move forward uh, with this Bible study, I pray, God, that we leave this place today knowing, dear God, that we do have the time to meet people's needs. So, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We adore you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. So, get situated up here. All right. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for your responses, for all the people who responded. I really appreciate that. Now, uh, let's get into the verse. Now, verse 25 starts off with the word and. Do y'all see that? All right. So anytime we see that, you know, that's important. You know, we should understand because it's, because there's something going on underneath the text, right? So, because obviously there was something that came before it. Because when you see and, that means that this connected to something, right? All right. So, I want to start off explaining the context behind this so that we can get a proper understanding of what's going on between the lawyer and, uh, and Jesus, all right? So, just to give some context really quick, all right? Let's start off with Jesus, all right? First off, Luke. The book of Luke is one of the most detail is is the most detailed gospel, meaning Luke is explaining the most intricate things all right, about about the ministry of Jesus. So to be short, Jesus was born, matured in wisdom, started his ministry and literally met the needs of the people. I mean, like that's basically what he was basically what he was doing. Why? Because that was his priority to meet the needs of the people. And it's found in Luke 4, 16 to 21, where he says, I have come to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free, preach the gospel to the oppressed, those, those, those type of deals, right? So Jesus is meeting the needs of all types of people in the surrounding area of Judea. I'm just trying to, just bear with me. I'm trying to set up some things for you guys, all right? 
cool? All right, cool. So he's meeting the needs for all these people in the surrounding areas in Judea, right? He's giving sight to the blind, resuscitating the dead, catching fish and men, healing leprosy, um, and paralyzed people, teaching people, making disciples, calming storms, casting out demons, etc. right? He's doing all of these things. Now, after he does these things, he starts to make his way back to Jerusalem. Right. Because in Luke nine, it says that his ascension was approaching. All right. And he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he was getting ready to meet the needs of the entire world by going to the cross. All right. So. Um, so in other words, he's basically getting ready to die. Right. And remember, it says that he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Why? Why was he determined? Because Hebrews 12, 2 says that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Right. So he so he's getting ready to go to the cross. Right. So he and then right before we get to this whole passage of the Good Samaritan, uh, he basically just sent out 70 messengers in pairs to every city and place where Jesus was going to proclaim that the kingdom of God was near. The story is flowing very well. And out of nowhere. All right. This lawyer stands up and asks the most random question. Now, remember, he had just got done sending out 70 messengers. He just got done healing all of these different people and meeting people's needs. All of a sudden, here comes this lawyer, asks a crazy question. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Like we weren't even talking about eternal life. Like where did this come from? OK. And so. Um, so now Jesus, and remember, Jesus is doing all of these amazing things while he is on his way to his death. And this lawyer pops out of nowhere and asks about eternal life. Now, for me, you know, I'm thinking, Luke, what are you talking about right here? Like, why? Like, like, what is all of this? What is this? What are you what are you getting at? Because it's not making no sense because it's not even going along with the story. All right. OK. So so I had to so I had to kind of do a little bit of research about this and I ended up finding Matthew 22 verses 34 through 41. So I want somebody to go there and I want somebody to read that for me. Matthew 22 verses 34 through 31. And I want you guys to keep in mind while you guys are looking, you know, that there are four different Gospels. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you guys should know that, right? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And each of these Gospels are different accounts of Jesus's life. It's just explained, you know, in a different in a different light, okay, in a different way based on the account of who's explaining it. Y'all understand that? All right. So, so now Luke or whatnot is explaining it in a different way, but Matthew is going to show us where this lawyer come from who this lawyer is and what this lawyer and why this lawyer asked this question about eternal life. So does somebody have Matthew 22? All right. Matthew 22 verses 34 through 41. Through 41. Yep. Okay. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. So now remember, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, remember, Matthew is giving a different account. Luke in Luke, the lawyer actually answers the question. But in Matthew, Jesus answers the question. Right. But the point is, well, why I want to point this out was because of who this lawyer is. Right. Because in Matthew 22, it says, and one of them. A lawyer and who, who was he talking about he was talking about the Pharisees because in the previous verse he just got done talking about you know the resurrection with the Sadducees right and so after he talked about the resurrection with the Sadducees we see this we see the Pharisees gather together and the and one of them one of the Pharisees who is a lawyer and remember a lawyer is a is like 
is a he he understands he's like an expert of the Mosaic law. OK, so he's like this expert. So it would make sense that the lawyer would hang out with the Pharisees. I mean, at the least. Right. Because the lawyer was, you know, like the the expert of the Mosaic law. And we have the Pharisees who are, you know, also experts of the, of the Mosaic law. Right. And so then we get this question when this lawyer is testing Jesus of like and asking this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now that makes sense, right? Because we're coming off the cusp of Jesus just got just getting done talking about, you know, the resurrection, right? Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees are they're different. They're, they're different people. One of them don't doesn't believe in the resurrection. The other one does believe in the resurrection. So, like you know, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees do believe in the resurrection. All right. So now, so. After I figured out all of this, I asked myself the question, why is a Pharisee who is the expert of the law asking Jesus about eternal life? And I'm like, surely he knows about Enoch in Genesis 5. You know, he got, you know, like he just you know, got taken away. He knows about that. He knows about Isaiah 29, uh, which says it here. Give me a second, I got it written down. Uh, your, dead, your dead will live and their, their corpse will rise. He knows the prophets, right? So... Why did he ask? And we and we, we kind of know that, right? Because he had already silenced the Sadducees about the resurrection and he wanted to put Jesus to the test, right? So he already had a wrong motive, even though he asked the question, all right? So now I want you guys to look at Jesus here for a moment. I'm, I want to try to make this transition over a little bit. Jesus is doing all this stuff. Like, like I said before, he's giving sight to the blind. Jesus is doing all of these different things and stuff like that. And let me mention, the Pharisees also are trying to do what? That they're plotting to do what? They're, pro they're plotting to kill Jesus, right? They're plotting to do all these different things. Now, as that's going on, Jesus is doing all this stuff. He's helping the healing the sick, raising, uh, like raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, you know, uh, making fishers of no, making fishers of men, all making disciples, doing all these different things, and to add. He's also about to experience the cross for the entire world. I'm like, Jesus, you got a lot going on right now. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, Jesus, like, like, why are you even wasting your time with this dude? Because honestly, you have a lot going on. I mean, if I was, if I was put, if I was to put myself in Jesus' shoes and someone is trying to kill me and literally plotting to kill me, and 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 then too, like, I know that. You know, I have to go and die for the world. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time with you being a Pharisee who are, who automatically knows the law and knows the answer to this question. Right. So. So. So here's the deal. When, I, when, I, when I'm looking at Jesus here, even though the lawyer asked Jesus this question to test Jesus, Jesus still responds and meets his needs. OK, so. Out of all the things that Jesus got going on, Jesus still makes the time to deal with this dude. So even though this lawyer didn't want his need to be met, because remember, he went to him with a different motive, right? So now I even asked this question. I said, Jesus, why are you wasting time with this dude? Ain't nobody got time for that. Right? I mean, that's that, that's exactly what I'm thinking in my head. Ain't nobody got time for that. Right. And I was like, it seems very odd that Jesus, while doing all of these things, is getting prepared to endure the cross and to die. Makes time for this lawyer, an enemy who really doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. But yet he but yet he still meets his need, although he was an enemy. He takes the time to meet his need by answering the question, but yet the dude was still an enemy. So I have a question for you, and I want you to I want you guys to try to answer this. All right. Why did Jesus make time for this lawyer? And when was the last time you met the need of your enemy? And, and, and I'm being like totally serious, right? Like, I mean, like, like seriously, because when I think about my enemies, I'm not necessarily thinking about meeting your need. I'm thinking some other things that I could possibly do to you. I mean, just, just being real, right? 
So I want you guys to try to answer that question. Why did Jesus take the time out for this lawyer? And when was the last time you met the need of your enemy? And, 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 and let me finish it with this. Do you have time for that? Don't go all at once. I need at least three volunteers to raise their hands and be like, man. So time out. All right, what, so with all of this being said, nobody's raising their hands. So you're telling me nobody in here has never met the need of your enemy. I mean, I know you did. Okay, Crystal. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So uh, when I think about well, when I think about enemy, it says that the Pharisees were plotting were plotting to kill him, right? Jesus previously in Luke was just got done talking about how we should love our enemies, and we see and and what I'm getting at right now is that we see Jesus um, being able to well, and a, an enemy is a person that actually opposes opposes you or opposes you no know, the dude that was opposing Jesus. And we're going to get into, you know, the lack of concern of, you know, what this what this what this lawyer had in, in a minute. But that's what that's what I mean about about an enemy like this dude was opposing Jesus because, number one, you know, you will see in a minute that they they actually ended up rejecting Jesus and rejecting God's God's plan and purpose. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And they were plotting to get rid of him or, or plotting to kill him. So this was literally a enemy to, you know, like to Jesus. Right. But Jesus, yet and still, still takes the time out to answer this guy's question, the dude that's going to get this dude killed. So, anybody? No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get deep and personal real quick here. Yeah. Awesome. I'm Michael. Hey, Mike. Uh, I've been coming here for about a month to church, and I want to check out this uh, gathering. So, um. In the not so distant past, my wife divorced me without biblical reason, and um, we have kids, and it's really tough. So I'm trying to love on them and everything. So she's my enemy in a sense, right? Okay. Um, definitely. And uh, so, um, you know, I don't want to sound proud, prideful, or anything. I, I haven't handled everything right in the whole situation, but um, she had this situation with the medical bill that was outrageous, and um, so I'm like, well. I'll negotiate it for you and pay it. So I negotiated for it and pay it, and it, and it was uh, not easy to do, but I did it anyway. So, Amen. Amen. There you go. Bro, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Yeah, that was. The... <laughs> um, I guess. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, I have. Um, I mean, I've been in a situation where I felt like somebody was against me. And in that moment, I felt that their need or what they needed um, was Jesus. <laughs> they needed love. <laughs> um, so I prayed for them and then also asked God to to help me to, to be obedient and loving them the way that he called me to love them and seeing them the way that he wants me to see them versus me um, seeing them for who they are. And honestly, they were just somebody who really was against me, just wanted to like, break me my spirit all that stuff um so i would say praying for them um because you know sometimes that's the first <laughs> thing they need is god and like love and also praying that god will surround them with the loving people that they need to have around them so that they won't be out trying to like i guess go towards people and break people's spirit but actually um if they have an issue dealing with it the right way um so Amen. Yeah. thank you Amen. Clap, hand clap, hand clap. You got something? Oh. <laughs> okay, let me see. All right, here we go. Man, so so I'm assuming that everybody else, we don't really meet the needs of our enemies too often. Right? But but you know, but Paul tells us to be imitators of Christ, right? So if Paul tells us to be imitators of Christ, I mean like Jesus is like literally meeting the need of his enemy. And basically, if we are to be imitators of Christ, technically we should have time for that. Now that's not, <laughs> now, now that's tough. Now, now, now that's real tough. And you know, like, and I'm, I'm gonna be straight up, you know, um, 
it's been really difficult. Like this, this, this particular part has been really difficult for me because it's been very difficult to meet the needs of my enemies, right? People who are literally against me and don't want good for me, right? Like, and you know, like just in the same example of this Pharisee or the in, AKA this lawyer doesn't want anything good for Jesus because he's just asking the question just to put him to the test. You see what I'm saying? But yet Jesus still is in a position to meet his needs regardless of his whole, of the whole deal, right? All right, so we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. Give me one second. No doubt. <laughs> All right, so now let's kind of talk about like the lack of concern for this lawyer. All right. And, and this is important when it comes to meeting people's needs and figuring out if we do have time for something. Right. So let's kind of get into this a little bit. Now, Jesus asked the lawyer, well, you know, after he asked, well, you know, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks him, well, you know, what does the law say? How does it read to you? Right. And the lawyer answered with a textbook response. The correct answer he gives. He says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Right. The lawyer answered right. But remember, he had other motives because the lawyer. Because it was because it says that the lawyer was wishing to do what to justify himself. Right. And I and, and then he asked, like, you know, like, like in this kind of remark, like, well, who is my neighbor? You know what I'm saying? Sucker. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, well, who, like, 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 who is my neighbor? Like this crazy response, right? And so now this question I asked myself, why is the lawyer trying to justify himself? Like, why? Someone go to Luke 7, verse 29 through 30. Yeah, Luke 7, verse 29 through 30. Somebody go there. And I want you guys to read Luke 7. Somebody to read Luke 7, 29 and 30. And just shout it out loud. Don't, don't, worry about, don't worry about the mic. Just shout it out loud. All right, now, so check this out. Now, to just to give some background of this particular scripture, right? If you're reading through Luke, all right, you know that Jesus or whatnot is, he's basically talking to these, um, to these two disciples of John, right? Because John, you know, this is like the same John the Baptist. John was not necessarily sure whether Jesus was the Christ, okay? And so, so he basically sent two of, two of his own disciples to Jesus to ask, was he truly the expected one or should we be expecting someone else? Right. And so basically Jesus calms John's doubts by sending the messengers back to John and saying, you know, look, look at what's happening. I'm, you know, uh, giving sight to the blind, you know, uh, the oppressed, you know, the captives are being set free. I'm doing all these things. Then he goes about talking to the people about who John was from the Old Testament. Right. The people believe, and then eventually what ends up happening is that the Pharisees didn't believe. They rejected Jesus, which means they rejected God's purpose. And in some, some translation says that they rejected God's plan, right? So we see right here that the lawyers and the Pharisees rejected God's purpose for themselves. In other words, they wanted to justify themselves based on their own desires and not what God had for them. Does that make sense? Right? So so that so that so that's what was going on in that in that deal. So they were not concerned with meeting the needs of the people, but they were more concerned with meeting their own needs. Okay? So but we see Jesus still finding the time, although he knows this, still finding the time to meet with this lawyer even though the lawyer was only trying to justify himself, okay? So Jesus is not only meeting the needs for, for those that he loves, but he's meeting the needs for his enemies as well, like we said before, right? So I have another question for you right here. Here's another question for you. 
Should we be concerned with others that are not concerned with us? Yes, right? We should definitely. Now, do you have time for that? Okay, okay. Yeah, so, like, man, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't be doing this, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, he's Jesus, though, right? I mean, like, like that's what I, that's what I would default to. I would say that sometimes. Like, you Jesus. You see what I'm saying? I would default, like, man, he Jesus. I ain't Jesus, so I can't be doing that. But what Jesus is teaching us here is that we should be loving our enemy just as much as we love our brother and our sister. That's what Jesus is teaching us right here. And we should be willing to meet the need of our enemy regardless if he is our enemy or our brother or our sister. Because in the previous, in the previous chapter, he ends up talking about loving our enemies. And he's saying, like, anybody can love, you know, someone that loves you back. Right? Anybody can do that. Uh, that's what he was. That's what he just got just got done talking about in, in chapter eight. Anybody can love anybody who loves them back. Anybody can, you know, pay somebody back who, you know, that 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 you know that that's gonna that you that you borrow from, and then they pay you back often. You can lend, right? You can do all these different things. But are you really willing to make time for your enemy, just as Jesus is doing as well? Because Jesus is meeting the need of not only his loved ones, but also um, his enemies, okay? So, so we can all agree that we should be concerned with others that are not concerned with us, right? All right, so check this out. Now, after the lawyer asked this question, Jesus gives this wonderful explanation because Jesus, the lawyer asked this question, well, who is my neighbor, right? Proving to justify himself. So after the lawyer asked the question, Jesus gives this wonderful explanation of what a neighbor is and who we should be as neighbors. OK. All right. So so let, let's kind of let's kind of look at this a little bit. He gives this parable and he says a man on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho was robbed, stripped, beat. And went and they went away, leaving him half dead. All right. So so now check this out. The journey between Jericho and Jerusalem was about anywhere between 16 to 18 miles. And people back then would usually take this journey on this particular road. Right. So, you know, in this in like I did some read some commentaries. They were saying that this road can be windy and turvy and stuff like that. And so in a lot of times, different types of people would come up and end up robbing different people on, on this particular road. So that's why. We see Jesus giving giving this example. All right. Now, remember, he was half dead, beaten half dead. And basically what this means is, is that this dude was beaten so bad that he couldn't really even move. Right. So then a priest comes by. Now, a priest comes by. Now, when you think about a priest, you know, like, all right, this dude, this dude finna really help me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like remember, the dude is half dead. He can't move. So he, he took like. Just imagine what he's thinking when he sees the priest come by. Like he's thinking like, oh, this is a religious man. You know, he's a righteous man. He's, you know, oh, oh, he's a Jew. Oh, you know what? He's definitely going to help me. Right. But he doesn't help him. He looks at him and says, all right, bro. And he keeps on going. Jesus describes this priest who is on his way somewhere. The priest is on a journey. Right. Because he's going somewhere. Right. He's going he's going to do something. And he sees this man. Right. But remember, back in Luke seven, the Pharisees were justified in themselves. Right. And they didn't they weren't necessarily concerned with the, with meeting the needs of the people. Right. So the priests were a part of that same system. So if they were a part of that same system, that means they had the same thought process, which means I'm more concerned about meeting my own need and not the need of this dude that is like half dead. Does that make sense? Right. So and because remember, they rejected God's plan and God's purpose. So they didn't have no love for God or no love for their neighbor. OK, because Blake said it earlier today, like, you I mean, like, how can you love somebody if you're not loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
You can't love your neighbor if you're not loving God, right? So, so after that, then comes a Levite. You know, he serves in the temple. You know, a man must have thought the same thing. Oh, this is a this is a religious man. You know, he's coming down. He's definitely going to help me. But the Levite was a part of the same system, right? Which means they had no love for God. No, this person specifically had no love for God and no love for their neighbor, right? So remember, these two people didn't have love for God because these two would surely know Deuteronomy 6. And, and this is where the, the, the lawyer gets his answer from when he answers, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He gets that and love your neighbor as yourself. He gets that from Deuteronomy 6. He gets that from the law because the law teaches that. But obviously, they found themselves worrying more so about the law versus about actually being what the law is saying to do. Does that make sense? All right. So these two people didn't have love for God because they because these two would surely know Deuteronomy 6 about loving God and neighbor. So these people who were concerned about, they were concerned more about themselves and their own desires and didn't have any time for the person who had a need. In other words, these two people of this broken religious system basically said, ain't nobody got time for that. And a lot of times we as people, when it comes to meeting the needs of others, because of our busy lifestyle and what we're doing, we say, Ain't nobody got time for that. Right. But the Bible is teaching us something different of saying, no, believer, you do have a, you do have time for that. You need to be able to meet the needs because your faith needs to be matching up with what. With what you with what you're believing, your works need to be matching up with your faith, as Blake said this morning, they're the two twins that that, that go together. Faith and works. Right. Now, but a Samaritan. I like this part because it kind of reminds me of like Ephesians 2, 4, when it says, but God being rich in mercy, you know, because of his great love, which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace we have been saved, right? That's what that but a Samaritan come by. And the Samaritan comes by and he shows compassion. Now, I want to give you some research about the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were considered the half-breeds. Why were they considered the half-breeds? Well, because, like, you know, back in, like, you know, long, like, a while back ago, the uh, Israel, or the northern kingdom of Israel, was basically overran by Assyria, right? And eventually some of the, and of course, they started to intermarry, Israel, some, um, some of the Jews started intermarrying with, you know, Assyria, and boom, we have the Samaritans, right? And this is one of the reasons why that the Jews hated the Samaritans the most. But here is Jesus using someone who the Jews hate the most to the one who actually shows compassion the most. Like when you look at the priest and the Levite versus the Samaritan, it's literally startling and striking of the contrast of how different they are. One actually shows that they didn't care about God and neighbor. The other one shows that they did. Okay, so... So we see that the Jews had, and also we see that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, right? And now, so check this out. And here is the here is this Samaritan who the Jews hated the most that was on the same road and on a journey, just like the priest and the Levite, but does something that is not a part of the normal corrupted religious system. The Samaritan is the startling and striking contrast of the priest and the Levite. He shows compassion and shows more love than the one that was supposed to have the truth and meet needs. Right? So now let's and so now let's kind of break down what this Samaritan does. All right. He does at least 10 things to meet the need of this one person. Okay? So let's break this down. Number one. He recognizes that there is a need. All right. Because remember in Luke 10, 33, he says that he saw him and felt compassion. So number one, he recognized that there was a need to be met. Okay. Number two. All right. He stops and then goes to him in order to meet his need. So 
So a lot of times we can recognize that there may be a need, but we may not actually meet it. Right? So like, oh, there's a need. Like, man, you know what? A lot of times we'll say, I'm just going to pray for you. Like, like, I mean, like a lot of times that's, that's what we say. Like, like and, and I don't really have time, you know, to really help you right now because of all the stuff that I have going on. But you know what? I'm going to pray for you. I hope you be blessed. Praise the Lord. And like, that's the end of the story, right? But this Samaritan actually takes the time to meet this dude's needs. Number three, he has, he then moves to meet his needs by doing these things. He bandages up his wounds and he pours oil and wine on his wounds. Now, oil and wine back in that time, you know, they were, they kind of, they were basically like the medicinal type things of what people would do to clean a wound, right? That's what, that's, that's why you see that he would pour oil and wine on him, right? He bandaged up his wounds, pour oil and wine on them, puts them on his own beast. So remember, the dude can't move. So that means that he ends up putting him on his own beast, meaning that he probably walked the rest of the way. So he puts him on his own beast. He walks the rest of the way. Now, usually, all right, they, then after that, he gets to an end. He brought him to an end, right? All right, usually you're like, all right, I got you to an end. All right, bro, you good. You straight, right? You, you know, you good. All right, no, all right, I got you here. You're straight, you're good. But he doesn't stop there. Like, he takes care of him. When he takes care of him, he stays overnight to take care of this dude. In the end. So, all right. So he picks him up, puts him on his own beast. He walks on his journey because, you know, there wasn't no cars back then. You know what I'm saying? So he walks on his journey, takes him to the end, stays overnight with this dude. Because later on in the verse, it says, on the next day. Right, that's what the verse says. On the next day, he goes. He takes out what? Then he comes out of his pocket to pay this dude two denarii. Now, anybody know what a, a denarii is? Yeah, yeah. So, like, it, it's, it's a daily wage, right? It's basically, you know, it, it was worth a day's worth of work. I find it completely amazing because usually like what i would think is you know what i lost a day you know what so i'm gonna come out my pocket for a day to help you but he don't come out just one he don't come out with just one denarii he come out with two days worth of some of of, of, of money to be able to help this dude out so that's that's the next thing then not only does he come out of his pocket he says hey to the um to the innkeeper when i return if there's anything else that 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 you do I got it. It's on my tab. So, so, and I want you to look at this part. He says, when I return, it's not a if I return, maybe I will return. It's when I return. So, remember, he takes him off his own beast, stays overnight with this, takes him to the end, stays overnight with this dude, financially takes care of this man, and then goes back to check on him. So here is Jesus explaining to this lawyer what a neighbor isn't with the priest and the Levite and uses a Samaritan, the people group that the Jews hated the most, to describe what a neighbor truly is. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. That, it, it, it was like that. For real. For real. Like, like seriously. So now here's something to think about. In this, in this parable, the Samaritan, he loses a full day to help out someone in need. He loses a day. Because remember, he was on a journey somewhere. So he, so he might have had a schedule that he was trying to get somewhere for at a, at a specific time. But dude didn't get there at the time that he, did, that he did, was supposed to get there because he was more concerned about the person versus what he had to do. Right. So in other words, the Samaritan was like, I got time for that. I got time for that. So I have a question for you. What is preventing you from meeting the needs of the people just like the Samaritan? Remember, he did 10 different things. Right. About 10 different things. Are we doing those 10 different things and going above and beyond 
every single time for a person that's in need. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, asked that, I answered that question for myself, and I said no. Man, what do you think? Well, t- tell me, tell me, talk to me. What do you think? Why do you think it's impossible? You're going to meet people every day, all day that need, right? It's, it's almost impossible to stop every single time um, and do those 10 things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try, but I'm saying that that kind of in itself just overwhelmed me because I'm like, how? Am I supposed to do that for every single person I come across with a need? Anybody? Any, no, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Anybody else? Not what she just said, but go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm thinking that for me personally, the way that I do um, try to meet the need is just uh, be very sensitive to the spirit. Like I don't believe that we're gonna connect with everybody. But me, I believe that the spirit's gonna let you know, hey, it's time to do that. But that's that's more of a strength. You know what I'm saying? The spirit will not crush the spirit. Like y'all just trying to um <clears throat> shove off the spirit, but it's good for you. And that's why Jesus said the spirit is good for you. For us to listen to you, for us to learn from you. Mm-hmm. That's how I feel that we should uh go help people out. Right, right, right. Cool. Oh, appreciate it. Anybody else? I'm almost so done. So the question is, what stops us from meeting people's needs? Well, what stops us from meeting people's needs just like the Samaritan did? So oh, okay. the, the Samaritan did about 10 different things as Jesus, because remember, Jesus is describing what a neighbor is because he's answering the question, well, who is my neighbor? Right. And he's giving us an example of what a neighbor is. Right. That like that. That's the, so, so he's answering this question and saying, yo, this is what a neighbor is. And this is what he did, because later on he ends up saying, you know, uh, well, which one of these three guys basically uh, proved to be a neighbor, you know, to, to, to the man. And, he, and then eventually he ends up saying the one who showed mercy. Right. And then Jesus gives this gives this uh, command and he says, go. And do the same. Um, I think for me, one of the things that came to my mind when you said this, you talked about him giving a denarii, which is a day's wage. Um, I think for millennials, and I'm guilty of this too, is like our finances aren't straight. So mm-hmm. when it's time to actually help somebody and we need to financially step up, we've got way too much debt and we're spending way too much money. And kind of like what Pastor Blake was saying, like you have a job being able to meet somebody else's financial need, but you go out and you spend it on, you know, X, Y, Z, and you're not willing to actually meet that. And I'm not saying that's the only way you can meet a need. It's not. But I think that's a big one for millennials. Is like we are bad with money. That's just yeah. what came to my head. Yeah. Anybody? Well, I, I have one. I'm almost done, so. Well, I can't. Yes. I have one real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that came to my mind was the follow up and a lot of times like you can meet a need but it goes back to like building that community with somebody because you can meet it and then you move on instead of saying oh well let me make sure that person is okay and we actually have time for like one more so What was the question one more time? Um, the question was, was that when was the last time you met a need just like the Samaritan did? Just like, okay. Um, man. I'm oh, sorry. No. It was, oh, what is preventing you? Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, like, Excuse me. My fault. What is, uh, wrong, wrong part. What is, what is preventing you from meeting the need like the Samaritan? Okay. Um, man. I can say for me, um, <laughs> I think it depends on the circumstance because I think like, because if we looking at how the Samaritan was, like he just had a specific focus. He saw a need and he met it without thinking about anything external from that. Like, you know, like for us, like if we see a dude, like we on the way to work and 
it's like, all right, this cat stuck out, but I might get fired. Then we both stuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, um, you know, like that's a that's a real thought, but I think at the same time though, like if you're so focused on the Lord and like what the Lord would have for you, even if like you know your boss be like, hey, you gotta go, bro, because you wasn't at work. But the Lord see the work that you did for this person, you know what I'm saying? Like, like it was one day I was on the way, um, yeah, to church. I think I was, uh, I think I had to do like sound check or something. Um, I was supposed to be there like eight. I remember I called you. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember was late. That, yeah. But I was passing by right on uh, Cypress North Houston right there. And I was like, I was driving. I saw this car stop. It was like a bunch of cars behind me. And it was a dude like sleep at the wheel. So. I was like, I could keep going because it's like 7.59. I got to be here at 8. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I could keep going or it's like, man, this dude could be dead. Some could be, you know, wrong with him. So I was like, man, I just turned around. I was like blowing my horn like real loud. Dude was like just sleep. So I was just like, man, it's a black dude. So I was like, man, I don't want to call the cops because like, you know, I don't, you know, anything could have been wrong and I don't want them to just like, you know, dude might wake up and, you know, he don't know where he at. Right, so right. happened, they mess around, kill him or take him to jail, whatever. So I ended up still calling 911, but I told him, I was like, hey, send an ambulance, you know, because that was the most logical thing for me. Like, don't send the cops, just send an ambulance. You know, it's a dude, he's at, you know. So they, they put an ambulance in route, but it just so happened the cop ended up coming by. And so, um, circled around and um you know i'm at my window now i was just telling him i was like man i was trying to wake this guy up um i don't know what happened with him but um you know just he was just like all right man he went and checked on him and everything and um they took down my information it was like you know he was in and out or whatever but it's just stuff like that i, I think i don't know if it would have been different if it would have been like hey you know i gotta clock in in like two minutes and you know my, my job is on the line i wouldn't have hoped that it would have been you know um, right but i think as what i know now like you know like the lord see like you know like we live for the lord so that situation right there would still be something that the lord would you know would bless i mean you know as opposed to like what man will do to you just because you didn't you know follow through with an obligation because you were trying to meet a need for somebody else you know what i'm saying so that's my take no thank you man Man, um, uh, I want to go back to what my sister Tamika said um, about um, that's just a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's a lot to do. Man, I'm going to be straight up with you guys, man. Um, ministry is self-sacrificing. Like, um, I, I, and, and, and that definitely sounds like a lot to do, right? Like, when you think about, all right, this dude did like 10 different things, right? I think I remember Pastor Wash telling us, hey, man, it costs like, what do you say it costs like maybe what ten thousand a year? Ten thousand a year to make a disciple. And and he was saying it from a place, not like a place of like, man, I got the door, you know, come out of my pocket, like, you know, to help out folks, but but he was saying like, you know, like I have to like, you know, pay for you or whatever, but he was saying it like like you might have to meet a need financially in order to be able to get this guy or this or whoever you're discipling to be able to serve, to be able to understand what service is. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what we are trying to do when it comes to meeting people's needs. We are providing a service for them, right? And yes, just like Jesus, remember, Jesus is going above and beyond to meet our needs, right? I mean, remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem to die for the entire world. Like, he literally is putting his life on the line. And in the same sense, we need to be putting our life on the line as well. Because remember, Paul is telling us, be imitators of Christ, right? So if Paul is telling us to be imitators of Christ, and Jesus is putting his life on the line for the people, we should be doing that as well, going above and beyond. Now, I do understand, who said that? Oh, um, I think Sean, I think Johnson Johnson said that about the whole deal of you know like we may not have you know like let's say like the time you know because we're doing all like I'm going to work right you know what I'm saying like uh, I got to be there at eight bro you know what I'm saying I can't like just stop help this dude that's on that's on the that's on the road you know what I'm saying like and his car broke down 
and it's like you know 750 and it take me 10 minutes to get to work and I'm supposed to be there especially like when you were a teacher cuz I used to be a teacher when you were a teacher hey you better be in your classroom by the time the kids get there right so like you know in in those scenarios I'm not saying and this is not saying don't operate in wisdom you see what I'm saying? Because you should be wise so you can keep your job to provide for your family. You know what I'm saying? No, that, that's that's not what we're saying here. But what we are saying is when we do meet needs, we need to be going above and beyond to meet those needs. Right? That's what we're saying. So, um, so now, here's the deal. And this is the conclusion that I came up with. All right? So this is the conclusion I came up with. Jesus then goes to ask this question. He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robber's hands? The lawyer answers correctly again. And he says, the one who showed mercy toward him. Right. So we meet needs. Because we should be showing mercy just as Christ is showing us mercy. OK. So, in conclusion, I believe that Jesus answers four questions for the lawyer. The lawyer asks him one, he answers four. Above and beyond. You see that? He asks a question, he, he basically answered the question, what is a neighbor? Right? A neighbor is one who shows compassion because we love God and people. Right? He answers another question, what isn't a neighbor? A neighbor isn't who is selfish, excuse me, a neighbor isn't one who is selfish and isn't one who shows no concern for God and people. He answers that. He answers another question, well, who is my neighbor? He, asked, he actually answered the question that he, that he said, my neighbor is anyone who is in need. Anyone. Because the man was a random dude on the street, anyone who is in need. And he also answers the question, how should we be a neighbor to other people we should be a neighbor to others by going above and beyond to meet their needs regardless of our current circumstance and current situation so i just want you to think about this question do we have time for that do we have time to meet the needs of the people just like the example in the parable that Jesus gave, do we have the time to be able to meet the needs of, the, of those people? And what Jesus is saying is that and when he gives the command to go and do the same, Jesus is saying, yeah, bro, you do got the time. Right? You do have the time. Because just like Pastor Blake was saying earlier today, what's the point? of having a faith if it's not working. What's the point of having this type of this this wonderful thing that Christ has done for us on the cross but yet we're not even we're not really even um perfecting our faith because we're not meeting anyone's needs. And that's the position that we have to be in because and how does this relate to community because this is all about community, right? I can't build a relationship with you if I'm not concerned about you. You see what I'm saying? If I if I don't if I'm if I'm not concerned with you, where is our relationship going? It's probably not going too far. I'm gonna give y'all this example. For instance, I'm gonna talk about me and my wife a little bit. When I was working, <laughs> when I was working, you know, like in like remember, I was working in Tomball, right? I'm sorry, my fault, boo. Thank you, babe. I was living in Tomball, working in Baytown, and I drove there five days a week, every day for the last two years. I just got a new job, and it's at home. <laughs> Amen. So remember, during these two years, this is what we experienced. I'm in seminary. I go to Moody Bible Institute. I'm in, I'm in seminary. Um, I am, I am uh, the lead over a ministry. Here at Crossover, I am also a married man. To my, I'm married. I have, a, I, have a, I have a wife. I have two children, 
And so what ended up happening was was that I lost track of time in being in being because I was doing so much other stuff like work in school. They, they took up the most of my time and, and home life. But here's the deal: home life came last for me. Home, like I'm just just being transparent. Home life came last for me, and it caused a major rift between me and my wife. Now here's the deal: I was more so concerned about my job and making an A in my class versus being concerned with my family. So if if I'm so if I am only, if I'm just concerned with those things. That means that my priorities were out of whack, right? So I am, for me, I had to be more concerned with the people because that hurt our relationship versus being concerned with me just making an A. More than likely, I will make an A. But still, I wasn't concerned with the person versus being concerned with what I was doing. And that hurt our relationship. And so I'm saying all that to say is, is that if I am more concerned about the person, that's going to build my relationship with the person versus tear it down. So we have to be able to be in a position to be more concerned with people so that we'll be able to meet the needs. And and remember, it doesn't come from our own strength. I need y'all to understand that. You know what I'm saying? Because you guys can't, pull all those different things from yourself because you will get burned out. This is why we have all these other people that's in here. This is why we have spiritual gifts because people who are able to operate in their spiritual gifts operate in a certain way to where they are able and gifted to do those things. And we have these people, um, this, this is why we're getting into that whole one another type deal, right? Because, and then like when you see, uh, like Blake talked about it today, Acts 2, 42 through 47, where it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, um, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and breaking of bread and prayer. And then they were saying that they were giving to anyone who might have need. It wasn't just one person doing that. It was the entire church that was doing that. You see what I'm saying? So like, even though you're not just meeting the needs of everybody by yourself, you're meeting the needs with everybody with a body of believers. And so that's and so that's that's where we need to be when it comes to meeting people's needs. And we do have time for that, especially if we're all together operating as one unit, right? Because Paul even Paul even talks about this how how like you know, hey, you know, the head can't operate without the feet, stuff like that, right? That's like actually Romans 12. You can go y'all can go read it. Romans 12. Right. So like so what I'm saying is, is that you guys, we all have to be able to meet the needs of the people together. And then it won't be too much on you because it never supposed to be all just for you to do. Does that make sense? So do we got time for that? Yeah, we got time for that. Amen. Hey, that's all I got. Praise the Lord. Amen. So uh, just to kind of give you guys some, um, just, you know, some, well, not really, uh, some, just some housekeeping things. Remember, we're, like you, you guys have already experienced this, we're going to have some type of refreshments. We know you guys just get out of church, so we want to put something in your belly, right? Um, also, next week, and for the, I'm just going to let you know what we're going to be talking about for the next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about family matters. and. Um, and so, like, we're going to be kind of just, and I don't know who we're going to be teaching, but we're going to see. <laughs> but um, but uh, but we're going to be talking about family matters next week. The week after that, it's going to be no new friends. And that should be interesting. And then the week after that is going to be um, relationship killers. So, uh, so, yeah, so just be prepared because I believe it's going to be, be a, a tremendous blessing for you guys and for, and for me, for me myself, right? Sounds good. All right, man. So, may, hey, like our goal is to get you guys out, if not before two, right at two. And it is 142, so I'm doing very well. So, <laughs> hey, man. Hey. Feel, feeling good, y'all. Hey, Amen. So, man, um, if you want, let's go ahead and pray, and we're done.
And if, hey, and, you, and we got a little bit of time, like we got about 20 minutes. So if you guys want to fellowship a little bit, you guys have some time to fellowship. And for the for the newer, so what, oh yeah, and, do y'all have any questions? Yeah, sure. Um, first off, it was really, really, really good. Um, but I think I understand like how it can be overwhelming to think of, you know, you know, there's so many people cause like literally every single person around us has like a need that needs to be met. Um, but I love what you said about how we're all doing it together. And I think if we wake up every single day with our mind set on, let me do my part. I don't think it'll be overwhelming because first off, you're not operating inside of your own strength. You're operating in God. Um, and the Bible tells us if you're operating in flesh, it won't happen. But if you, you know, depend on God for everything, you'll be like a tree planted by the water, always bearing fruit, always doing what you need to do. But it's also as simple as waking up every single morning and saying, God, whose need do you want me to meet? Because if I'm assuming correct we all have jobs we all have people on our jobs we all have you know friends that we've made people that we come in contact with and it's literally as simple of, as asking god and waking up every morning making sure you're in tune with him and asking him whose need do you have to do you need to meet and it's not even always going to be monetary it's literally going to be a person who needed someone to listen to them and you met that person's need it's going to be somebody who needed a joke the joke that you have for them and you met that person's need because it kind of gave helped them to laugh and when they laugh they access joy when they were able to access joy they were able to forget about what was going on in their life and actually you know start walking in some positivity so it's literally as simple as um and this is just me saying and as an encouragement to everybody to make not make it so big and not make it so oh my goodness you know me get my list of people that i need to meet the needs of but literally say god who do you want me to effect like who do you want me to make an impact on who do you want me to um be used to meet their need and i have a friend who uh challenged me to do that and i've started doing that every single day and i'm amazed that like the littlest things can make the biggest difference in meeting somebody's needs um just like you mentioned as teachers like us as teachers especially right now it's like the schedules are big and it's busy and you have so much you have to do but I remember like going to God and I was like, God, like who's need? I know I have a lot of stuff to do. I'm like, whose need do you want me to meet today? And he started showing me so many people in so many ways, like as simple as making a copy for somebody, as simple as picking this paper from the office and taking it to that person in their class and I'm passing it by. Like it's literally not as time consuming, not, not as tasking as we make it out to be. I think us as just human beings period we naturally have the tendency to like overthink things and then we overthink it then we overwhelm ourselves and when you overwhelm yourself and you're like anxiety ridden that i know for me when i when that happens i don't do anything at all <laughs> like that's my response I'm like you know i'm not just not going to touch it at all but it's really not it doesn't have to be that way like you can literally just simple prayer god whose needs do you want me to meet today Help me to stay in position to hear from you, leading me to meet this person's need. And also help me to depend on you and not my own flesh because my flesh wants to do X, Y, and Z and cross off everything on my list. But we just want to get to the place where we are more concerned with God's to-do list for us and, you know, not our own. So, yeah. No, that's good. Um, so one of the things I've been praying for also is that um, is for me to – you know, record, like being able to recognize the need, you know, and um, being able to have, I'm praying for that God will, I guess, increase more of my compassion for others, you know, because other people need, I mean, they need compassion, you know, and that's something that I've been, I've been definitely praying for as well. Brittany. So thank you, Nafisa, for that. As you were talking, I thought of something that's been really helpful for me. Um, there's this phrase that's kind of been going around for over a hundred years, I think, and it's called do the next right thing or do the next thing. Um, and that's been really helpful because sometimes when I see a need, I go 15,000 steps down the line and I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to consume my whole life. Um, but if I just do the next thing, then I don't have to, like you were saying, get overwhelmed or anxious. I can just do the next thing. And like, God is with me in right now, not in my ideation about what could happen when everything goes the worst it could possibly go. Um, but doing that next right thing is very encouraging and manageable. And there's a lot of grace in right now and not like 
all the way in my mind. That's good. Thank you. Um, no, man, like that's that's so real because just and I want you guys to keep in mind to the going above and beyond. Like like I said, we're not doing that by you're not doing that by yourself, right? Like we are a body of believers that should be operating as one unit doing it together. Okay? So just keep that's always keep that in mind. Like, you know, and, and don't be afraid if you have a need that needs to be met. Like, we are here to help you. Like, people that are here in this room, like, right now, like, for the women, you know, go to go to Ashley, go to Brittany, go to Desiree, like, you know, go to Crystal. Like, there's a people, there are people that are here, um, Natalie, there are people that are here that are able to help you through certain situations. Um, I'm going to give this example. You know, I've been, I pick on Brittany all the time. I'm going to give this example. So, like, for instance, one day Brittany called, was like, hey, Joaquin, like, you know, my car broke down, Right. And, you know, I was like, okay, so where are you? And they're like, man, we're at Menchie's. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, cool. So, man, one thing I did, I called Crystal. I said, like, hey, babe, you know, Brittany's car broke down. Can I go help her? And I asked that because I was concerned about Crystal because this, it was already late in the day, right? And Crystal was like, yeah, that's cool. All right, boo. All right, all right fool, got you. All right. So me and Crystal were cool. And then I was able to go and help Brittany with her car, right? So not only did I help her with her car, I changed her tire to another flat tire that was in her car, right? So like we 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 switched out the tire. The tire was flat. I changed it and the tire that I got out of her car was flat also. And so and then it started raining on us. And we're like, "Okay, so this is cool. It's cool." So then the then after that, remember together, right? We got together um, the church and the church ended up paying for you know for her or whatever, but we fronted the bill as the young adult ministry. So so like and so here's what I'm saying: it just doesn't stop at us changing a tire. You see what I'm saying? So like you know, so I so we talked about it to everybody else. Everybody chipped in or whatever, and we helped her out with the tire. Now that may be like minuscule to some folks, you know what I'm saying? But but hey, like that goes a long way for someone who lives all the way in Missouri City. You see what I'm saying? So like um so going above and beyond, you know, is what we need to be on is what we need to be doing. But remember, we went above and beyond together. Not only one person did that. And it's not meant for just one person to do anything. Does that make sense? Cool. And we got ten minutes, y'all. Any, any. So, any, anything else? So, I'm gonna see you guys next Sunday. Um. So, um. So, uh, let's pray. Let's pray out. Thank you, guys, once again for coming. That's um. That's all we had. And um. And invite a friend. You know. Um. Tell them that the Truth Ministry is here, and we're here to meet your needs. Okay. And, and the reason why we are able to do that is because we are able to do that together. Joaquin is not just going to meet your need by myself, but I'm going to meet. We're going to meet your need with with this ministry, and I want you guys to come alongside of us to be able to help us to meet the needs of the people as well. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go ahead and pray. And who's coming next week? Amen. Hope I see y'all next week. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, we come to you firstly and foremost uh, to say thank you. Thank you, God, for this uh, Bible study today. Uh, we appreciate um, all that you've done for us. I pray for traveling grace and mercy as we depart from this place. Um, allow us to meet new people today. Allow us to fellowship um, and um, just discuss, you know, maybe the Bible study, um, discuss life, and um, allow us to God to be able to figure out, recognize that there's a need to be met. Um, let us actually meet those needs and follow up on the needs that have been met as well. And Lord God, um, allow us to know, dear Father, that we do have time, dear Father, to meet needs, and we can and we can put ourselves in that in in that position to do those things, dear God, because you have called us to meet the needs of the people. Lord, help us, dear, dear God, to be imitators of Christ, dear Lord, so that needs may be able to be met, and so that we can be able to make time um, for um, for another person, dear Lord. So, Lord, thank you so much. Uh, until next week, dear God, we love you, we adore you, we bless you. It's in your son, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.